Well, fantastic. Uh, welcome you all for joining us on um, our information uh, webinar on our upcoming cohort. Um, my name is Sean Auckland. I am the local government program manager for SPEAR, and SPEAR is a South Central Partnership for Energy Efficiency as a resource. Those of you who are joining most likely received a personal invitation from us or have heard about us, but those that you haven't, just a, I wanted to let you know a little bit about us that we're a regional energy efficiency organization and a 501c3 nonprofit. Our territory is Texas and Oklahoma. Our mission is to accelerate the adoption of energy efficient products and services, as well as mechanisms for, uh, and we do this through several program areas, which um, I, is I, I listed on our um, slide. And I'll also just talk about it a little bit more. Our members are uh, diverse allies and partnerships, including utilities, municipal owned utilities, retail electric providers, implementers, state and local governments, um, as well as um, other type of organizations. And much of our um, work includes uh, educating legislative staff, promoting policies that advance energy efficient technology, research and other innovations. Um, here, we know that the primary driver of Texas peak demand is residential heating and cooling. So we do quite a bit of work in energy code adoption. And we work closely with local governments for energy reporting and climate action. And we also provide a, quite a bit of uh, um, a, a training for local governments and, and local government uh, inspectors. We also have a heat pump working group. And then uh, we also build technology uh, and do code enforcement trainings. Um, I did want to talk about a little bit since 2000, peak demand in ERCOT's region has risen over 45%. And that trend is continuing with more people and businesses flocking to the state, Texas specifically, daily. And then we know that energy efficiency and demand response can mitigate some of these incredible demands that we see in both winter and summer peaks. Um, that is, if you want more information about SPEAR, I'm happy to speak with you about what the local government program looks like, as well as our other focuses uh, with um, policy, uh, um, training and code and building optimization, um, and as well as a strong focus of training. Uh, but without further ado, I'm going to kind of go into uh, and welcome Ickley, uh, who um, is going to be uh, putting on the uh, this cohort and just so they can go into further depth. So what I will do is I'm going to stop sharing and also turn off my video and microphone and let you get started. Hi everyone, are we able to see my screen? Yes. Perfect, thank you so much, Sean. Um, hi everyone, my name is Angelica and I lead ICLE USA's work on climate change adaptation and community resilience. I work with communities across the country to understand, assess, and mitigate risks caused by climate change. So just a bit of background um, for this project, um, SPEAR has partnered with ICLE USA, which is the U.S. Office of ICLE Local Governments for Sustainability. Um, ICLE is the largest global network of cities, towns, counties, and regional governments working together on sustainability issues. I'll be leading this program uh, in partnership with my colleague, Ann Jansen, so you might see that name on emails and materials as well. So one of the most distinctive features of the places that we live is their weather. Um, and oftentimes what we kind of notice the most and need to plan for are extremes. So that can be flooding, storms, wildfires, deep drought, um, it just depends on where in the country you live. And we know right now at this point that climate change is making extreme events worse. Um, and Oklahoma and Texas are of course no exception to this. Um, in Oklahoma, we know that temperatures have risen by 0.6 degrees Fahrenheit since the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and historically unprecedented heat is projected in the coming years. Um, extreme precipitation, which can cause dangerous flooding, is also expected to increase, um, and that brings with it the risk of soil erosion and contaminated runoff polluting our streams and lakes. Um, risk of drought is also increasing, and this is both due to increased evaporation caused by higher temperature and more variable precipitation. So in Texas, temperatures have already warmed by 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit, 
um, and more warming is projected in the coming years. So like Oklahoma, Texas can expect more variable precipitation leading to extremes on both sides of that coin. So flooding and droughts, both damaging. So it's difficult to project storms and hurricanes, but if we look at our past data and models, um, the state of Texas should really plan for increased frequency um, and intensity of hurricanes and higher storm surge due to sea level rise. So what can we do about all of this? Um, well, for starters, it's important that we start by recognizing that the impacts of climate change are not set in stone. We absolutely have the power to make things better if we take action now. So there are two main avenues through which we can take action. Um, one is climate change mitigation by reducing greenhouse gas emissions by, for example, um, driving less or switching to renewable energy. This will lower the magnitude of the climate changes that we can expect um, and can help ensure that us, um, our children, future generations can have a climate that is livable. Um, that being said, we know that many of the impacts of climate change are already occurring and will get worse even if we do reduce our emissions. And so that's where the other side, adaptation, um, which is the focus of this cohort, comes into the equation. So adaptation includes actions that reduce the severity of the impacts to our communities. Um, some examples include flood protection, um, infrastructure upgrades, and disaster management planning. So this cohort opportunity has several parts. Um, the first are live one-hour web-based sessions, monthly for five months, starting in January of 2024. During those sessions, participants will hear from a guest speaker, um, for example, a peer local government, um, and the ICLE team will also give an instructional presentation and answer questions. We'll also be providing take-home exercises. Um, these are brief, like less than a one hour time commitment, homework assignments that can help you jumpstart your planning process. Um, for example, that could mean we ask you to draw up a list of departments um, and external stakeholders to include in future work on resilience, um, or we might ask you to download climate change projections for your local area, something like that. Um, and then the third element are group work sessions of about 30 to 60 minutes, where you'll have the chance to practice key skills. So for example, um, you might work in groups to review your take-home exercises um, or have kind of group, group share outs of discussions. Um, participants will also have the option of scheduling up to two one-on-one -on -one check ins with the ICLEI team um, to ask more individual questions. So our outcomes, um, participants should finish the cohort with a baseline understanding of climate risk and vulnerability assessments, resilience planning, regional climate projections, and inclusive community engagement. So if these topics are interesting to you, um, this cohort will be a great fit. Um, participants will also have the completed take-home exercises that you can use to jumpstart um, local resilience planning. Um, you could also use them even for planning processes that aren't necessarily like climate. Um, so they could be plugged in, for example, into a master comp plan, a hazard mitigation plan, um, or a similar process. Um, one thing I do want to flag is that the work will be tailored to a more introductory level audience, um, but that does not mean that we don't welcome cohort participants who do have more experience. Um, those who are more advanced will definitely still benefit from the activities, the guest speakers, of course, also networking and peer learning opportunities. Some details. Um, it's completely free to participate. You don't need to pay. SPEAR has generously uh, provided the funding to run this cohort. Um, this cohort is open to local governments, regional planning councils, and tribal nations in Texas and Oklahoma. So 15 to 20 entities can participate and they can each send two staff. Um, I do also need to note that consultants um, are not going to be included in this opportunity. We are limiting it to local governments and their staff. Um, as far as the time commitment, staff who participate can expect to spend around one and a half to three hours every month on this. Though, of course, if you want to put in more time, um, put more effort into the take-home exercises, um, it could be a larger time commitment. That's up to you. You do need to apply to be considered. It's a very quick application. Um, Spear can put that link in the chat, and we'll also share it with everyone after today's session. Be sure you apply by November 16th, since we are trying to have our participants finalized before the end of the year. This is just a quick preview of the curriculum. There are five training sessions. 
Um, the first is going to kick off the cohort and introduce participants to resilience planning. Um, that second session is going to be all about equity and stakeholder engagement. That one you can see is paired with that starred working session on equity. During the working session, um, participants are going to practice identifying stakeholders to be part of their planning process. Um, for example, you'll talk about like who needs to be in the room for these conversations. And we'll also talk about how you can center equity um, in your work. In session three, we're going to go over climate hazards, projections, and impacts for the two states. Um, in case you're not familiar, climate projections are modeled future conditions. Um, and so when you hear someone say something like, Texas could be X degrees hotter by 2050, that means that they're using a climate change projection. Um, that session three will then be followed by a work session where we'll talk about your local hazards. Um, and it'll also be a great chance to ask questions on projections. Session four is going to be all about the mechanics of assessing climate vulnerability and risk. That's because if we're going to move forward into our action planning stage, we really need to understand with greater specificity what are our local government's risks um, and our community's risks. So, for example, um, we need to know if a certain neighborhood floods every time it rains. That's an example. Um, and then we want to be able to compare those risks to each other so that we know where we most urgently need to take action. We'll practice some of the methods that we talk about in session four during a working session where we do a um, practice rapid CRVA. Basically, that means we're going to go through the motions of the activity um, so that you feel prepared to do similar work with stakeholders in your own community. And the results of that rapid CRVA certainly won't be complete, um, but they could be a strong foundation for anyone who then wants to go forth you know, after the cohort, during the cohort, um, to do this work in more depth. Um, after that, we'll have a last session on funding and implementation. So we'll talk about ways you can identify adaptation actions and strategies and also design resilience projects that are um, ready to receive funding um, that are attractive for funding opportunities. Here's just a preview of what some of the take home or, or homework assignments um, could look like. These two are both based on materials that were created um, by the U.S. federal government, um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, as part of the U.S. Climate Resilience Toolkit. So you're welcome to spend as much time on this kind of activity as you want, but do know that none of them are designed to take longer than 30 minutes to an hour. The specific exercises you see here, um, one on the left is used um, to brainstorm staff and um, community members you might want to include in your project. And then the other one has a set of instructions for collecting information about climate change projections from federal sources. We'll also be sharing the ICLEI USA Vulnerability Assessment Toolkit with everyone in the cohort. It has a template for a climate risk and vulnerability assessment you could use to structure your work, um, materials for community engagement, including a, a meeting in the box that you can customize, um, a survey template, and lots of other exciting things. Okay, I'm happy now to take questions. Thank you so much, Angelica. So we haven't had too many questions come in, uh, but let's see. So once a person kind of goes through um, Oh, here's one. Um, they understand that sessions are free to join the cohort, but does this also include ICLEI access? If so, for how long? And does it include support? Yes. So sessions are free. Um, as part of the cohort, participants who aren't members of ICLEI um, will have access to, I believe it's up to two one-on-one -on -one support sessions um, just to chat with us. There are also, of course, you'll have access um, to ask individual questions during the working session. As far as access to the materials, I believe we leave them open to you all. Um, it might be for the rest of the year, but it, it's certainly for the five months of the cohort period that you'll have access to the materials. And again, how long is the cohort? How long does it last? So the opportunity is gonna be five months. So January to May, we'll have sessions. Um, the actual sessions will last about an hour. Um, working sessions will be about 30 to 60 minutes. 
Um, and we'll be having one uh, session every month, just also to be mindful of everyone's time commitments. Great. And then another question was access to ClearPath. Would the cohort participants have access to be able to utilize ClearPath during that time? So no, not through this cohort. Since we're focused on adaptation, we'll only provide, be providing access to um, our adaptation toolkit. And then also, can you go in more depth with the uh, about the CRVA assessment and how you came to select this assessment versus others? Um, I'm thinking this might have to do with the rapid climate risk and vulnerability mm -hmm. assessment activity. Um, so the reason we're, we're focusing on, on this is because um, climate risk and vulnerability assessments are, are the foundational piece for climate action planning. For those of us who might have done work on climate change mitigation, you might be familiar with a greenhouse gas inventory. Um, CRVAs and um, inventories are certainly not exactly the same, like they're not equivalents of each other. But in my opinion, for a community to embark on a successful adaptation process, whatever that looks like, they first need to have a very strong understanding of their specific risks, um, the risks that their local community faces. Um, it's not really something that can be cookie cutter. And so that's why we're going to be focusing on CRVAs. Um, and specifically that rapid CRVA activity, it really is just meant to be a practice for you. Um, you'll kind of get that experience of how do I think about vulnerability? Like, how do I think about things like sensitivity or adaptive capacity kind of in a, in a stakeholder working group type setting? Um, and so then if you do want to do similar activities, you're like, I've got this um, and you're already ready to go. Great, thank you for going into that more in depth. Uh, and then another question is the CRVA is at a community level versus at an asset level, if I'm understanding that correctly. So we will give people a kind of a choice in how in-depth you want to go. Um, because this is a more entry-level cohort, certainly the tools that we provide are not designed to be an asset-by-asset -asset, um, assessment. If you wanted to do that level of assessment, we could certainly provide some technical assistance during the one-on-one -on -one check-ins. Um, it's just that the materials are designed to be more on a community systems level. So what that means is in the vulnerability assessment, we won't be so much as focusing on like, okay, this power plant, this wastewater treatment plant, but we'll be thinking on a higher level about systems. So what are the vulnerabilities of our um, power supply system? What are the, you know, what vulnerabilities do we have in water and wastewater management systems? Um, so it, it is a bit higher level with the option of drilling down in more depth, I can also certainly provide instructional resources um, for anyone who wants to do that more in-depth work. If someone's interested in doing more in-depth work, or also if the basis of the cohort, cohort applicants have a more experience, then there's an opportunity to do a deeper dive. So yeah, exactly. It's just that the materials that we're providing won't really be tailored for that, but we can certainly support with it. Okay, great. Um, and, and another question was, will there be in-person meetings? I don't believe there will be, but I'll let you also take that one, Sean. There's opportunity uh, potentially for where if we have a host, we could potentially do a hybrid in-person meeting where we could um, have one of our trainings be where she uh, is virtual, but we are in person. And, and But that would just depend on the host and the capabilities they have for that. Any other questions? Great. So again, this is a, a SPEAR sponsored cohort, and we're really looking forward to engaging the communities and providing resources through training. And that is something that this past year through our statewide survey demonstrated that local governments are really wanting to have um, with their staff, they are leaning into more of a stronger need for technical training. And so this is a way that SPEAR is stepping up and stating, hey, we will support that uh, and um, sponsoring this ICLEI cohort on resilience. Um, 
as well as we would love to see if there's any other communities who um, this, um, as she has stated, will provide some basis for opportunities of you already having the information that you need once you finish this cohort to apply for a lot of the federal funding mechanisms that are going to be rolling out with the IRA and the IAJA. And also, it would hopefully some of these aspects will support the CPRG deliverables that some of these communities that are participating um, will need. So if you have any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat or you're welcome to reach out to Angelica directly or myself. And uh, we look forward to those of you who are interested in participating. Um, again, the application period is up until November 16th, so we can get everything started and rolled out um, after uh, the holidays. So if there are not any other questions, I'll pause and allow for that. Yes, um, the slides will be shared as well as the recording. I'll be posting this recording um, by probably a next Wednesday online. So we'll be sharing that as well on, on the Spear YouTube page. So the slides will be shared actually today, um, as, uh, as well as an email with all this information that's been provided, including the application link and the one page informational flyer that we have. And uh, you can also, the, the YouTube uh, um, Spear channel will also be shared in that email today. All right, well, thank you all again for sharing your time and being interested in learning more about this cohort. And I hope to, to be working with you all in the coming months. And I'm very excited about our partnership with ICLEI. Thanks everyone for being here. Hope to see you in the cohort. Yeah.